All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin the last couple of sessions. We're kind of winding down for the year. And uh, so today we're going to talk about interface dermatitis. And uh, as you all remember, there are basically two types of interface dermatitis. There is lichenoid, and then there is vacuolar interface dermatitis. We're going to talk a little bit about both, uh, mostly lichenoid today, but I think we have a couple of slides on, on some uh, vacuolar alteration. Relatively short topic today. Um, there's not a gazillion diseases that give you lichenoid inflammatory infiltrates, but uh, you do need to know these for the board examination. They're definitely going to ask you some questions about this. Obviously, lichen planus is a very common disease that uh, we as dermatologists have to know about, have to know about the diagnosis and treatment of it. So uh, you're going to be asked some questions. And we talk about lichenoid inflammatory infiltrates. We basically mean that it looks like lichen planus. And then, of course, we know that lichen planus is diagnosed that way because it looks like a lichen in nature. It looks uh, flat and it's got uh, the Wickham stria that look kind of like the little folds on top of the, uh, the fungus that grows on rocks and trees and that sort of thing. So uh, basically, uh, we talk about lichenoid inflammation. You know, we talk about lichenoid uh, eruption clinically sometimes, basically. Uh, basically, we're talking about things that look like lichen planus. And for a, a, a disease to be truly an interface dermatitis, this important point here, it really needs to obscure the interface, okay? So if it doesn't really cause vacuolar change that, that turns the interface into little holes, or it doesn't give a uh, inflammatory infiltrate that actually goes to the interface and, and you can't really tell sort of where the interface begins and the, and the infiltrate uh, begins, you really are not dealing with lichenoid. And a lot of people say that um, and they use it in a sloppy way, but it's not really lichenoid unless it truly obscures the dermatural junction. And that's, you know, kind of important because there are a number of diseases that can kind of give you a band-like infiltrate but not lichenoid, like for example, mycosis fungoides um, and certain other drug eruptions and things like that. They can actually give you kind of a band-like eruption, but they don't actually get truly at the interface all the time. So if you really want to make a diagnosis of lichen planus, you really need to see a lichenoid infiltrate that obscures a DE junction like here in this, this example of lichen planus. Okay, so what do we see in lichen planus? Well, basically you get this band-like lichenoid infiltrate that obscures a DE junction. You've got individually necrotic keratinocytes often at the basal cell layer, and those are given some interesting names. They're given like savat bodies. You get these little clefts, Max Joseph spaces. You also get the wedge tape hypergranulosis. You see that right here. That's often seen at the sites of a hair follicle or an actual structure. And those correlate with what we see uh, clinically as the Wickham stria. Okay, so those are the, uh, that's, that's, this is classic. Usually lichen planus gives you uh, hyperkeratosis, like you see here, ortho hyperkeratosis usually does not give you a lot of parakeratosis, it's usually not a lot, very much in the way of crust or things like that in the cornified layer. So this would be a, a beautiful classic example of lichen planus. As you look at higher magnification, the infiltrates consisting almost wholly of lymphocytes, usually do not see plasma cells in this. If you see plasma cells in a lichen infiltrate that really and truly does obscure the junction, uh, you need to be thinking about syphilis. And I've seen some cases of syphilis look almost exactly like lichen planus. So you do need to think about that when you see that pattern. And uh, this would be considered a so-called Max Joseph space, a little cleft here. And sometimes you actually can get a true subepidermal blister in lichen planus. You get the uh, uh, you know, there's really a loss of cohesion when you get the inflammation that obscures the dermatomal junction like you see here. And it actually can sometimes get a blister or become erosive, especially when you're dealing with lichen planus um, in a mucous, mucous membrane location, such as in the mouth or the, the uh, genital area. So this is a nice classic example of lichen planus. Um, also notice uh, you get the so-called sawtooth jagged irregular epidermoresia. And if those if the infiltrate goes on long enough, you may actually get effacement and loss of the epidermoresia like you see here. So we don't even see the sawtooth jagged epidermoresia here. Um, there are some you know, possible individually necrotic keratinocytes here and there, so-called savat bodies or 
um, the colloid bodies. And uh, so this is really a prototypical example of lichen planus. Now, I would strongly recommend that even though you've got the histology of lichen planus here, that uh, you should basically um, know everything there is to know about lichen planus um, clinically. So there's about 10 different forms of lichen planus. There's lichen planus pilaris, um, there's mucosal lichen planus, there's hypertrophic lichen planus, as you can see um, near, you know, often on the, the pretibularies, for example. Um, so you need to know everything there's known about lichen planus, all the clinical manifestations, the histology of lichen planus, the histology of the different variants of lichen planus. So just make sure that you know all of those because you're going to be quizzed on those on the board examination. So-called Graham-Little syndrome, where you get lichen planus pilaris involving not the scalp, but also involving the glabrous skin, other parts of the body. So this is lichen planus. Now, one other question that sometimes comes up is the distinction between lichen planus and a lichen planus-like um, drug eruption. Those can look virtually identical to one another. Um, if you see eosinophils in the infiltrate, um, that would tend to favor a uh, lichenoid drug eruption, but you do not have to get eosinophils in a lichenoid drug eruption. You can also get lichenoid photodermatitis. Those are usually lichenoid drug eruptions that are photo exacerbated, like, for example, with uh, a, a hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, again, those don't have to give eosinophils an infiltrate. They often do have them, but they don't have to. And they can look really very, very similar to lichen planus. So if you're called upon to differ differentiate between a lichenoid drug eruption and lichen planus, uh, histologically, you're not gonna be called upon to do that for a board examination. If they were gonna ask you between those two, which they almost 99% of the time, I, I wouldn't even think that they would, uh, they would probably show you something that has a lot of eosinophils in it. So that's lichen planus. And that's the classic lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate that we see uh, histologically. Um, somebody went on there and put some lines on there. I don't know if you guys can get rid of those who ever put that on there. Um, I don't know how that happened, but it's a little bit distracting. Um, this is uh, an example now of a, another lichenoid inflammatory process here, but it's not truly inflammatory disease. This is a benign lichenoid keratosis. And it's also lichenoid, like an inflammatory infiltrate. As you see here, it's truly obscuring the dermatrophal junction. Um, it's got some sawtooth epidermal reedy over here. So it looks a lot like lichen planus. It's got wedge-shaped hypergranulosis and hyperkeratosis. So if you just saw a shave biopsy that just kind of focused on this area alone, you wouldn't be able to tell the two apart, okay? Now, the problem is, uh, the way to, to tell these apart is if you look off to the side and you see evidence of a uh, solar lenigo or macular severed keratosis like you see here. So a benign lichenoid keratosis is basically a macular severed keratosis or a solar lenigo that gets an inflammatory infiltrate of lymphocytes that develops a lichenoid pattern to it. And if you just, you know, if you get look at it without any information, uh, it's sent in as uh, just, you know, with nothing, you might think about lichen planus because it can look very, very much like lichen planus. You just had a field like this. Um, these usually just like lichen planus don't give the eosinophils and infiltrate. They usually give you more lymphocytes than eosinophils. Um, you can get necrotic keratinocytes. Uh, so you can get the savate bodies and the colloid bodies with uh, BLK, just like you can get with, with lichen planus. So they can look pretty much the same in some fields, but the key is to see the presence of the macular separate keratosis, the horn pseudocyst here, and other changes off the side that really allow you to make the diagnosis. So again, clinically, these are usually submitted to us as rule out basal cell carcinoma or something like that. They're not clinically confused with lichen planus. They just look like lichen planus under the microscope. Okay. One other thing about lichen planus I didn't mention before, but if you do immunofluorescence, direct immunofluorescence of lichen planus, it can be either completely negative with no immunoreactants, or it can have sort of shaggy deposits of fibrin, diffuse coarse granular at the dermoepidermal junction, and the individual savate bodies and collar bodies can be highlighted with IgG, C3, or IgM uh, in some cases there as well. So that's the immunofluorescence of lichen planus if it's done. Usually you don't need it. Uh, most people don't do immunofluorescence, 
but if you do and it's positive, it's going to give you that pattern. Okay. Now, when you're looking at a lichen infiltrate, um, there's several things you should ask yourself. We already talked a little bit about that, but you know, you want to ask yourself, uh, you know, what uh, type of cells are in the infiltrate? Are they lymphocytes only? Are there lymphocytes and plasma cells only? Uh, if you see that, you might want to think about syphilis if they're plasma cells. Are they histiocytes? Is it lichenoid with granulomatous inflammation, which is a relatively rare pattern we'll talk about in a moment? Um, is it a maybe not really truly like it an infiltrate, but maybe a band-like infiltrate with lymphocytes and abundant eosinophils. We see that pattern in the urticarial stage of bullous pemphigoid. Um, we sometimes see a true interface dermatitis with vacuolar alteration with lymphocytes and eosinophils and necrotic keratinocytes, um, in some cases of superficial inflammatory variants of fixed drug eruption. So those are, are some of the things you want to look for. So ask yourself, okay, is the pattern lichenoid? Well, if it is lichenoid, what kind of cells are infiltrate? Depending on what kind of cells in the infiltrate, we're going to um, uh, be able to make a more definitive diagnosis. Uh, ask yourself, is the lichenoid inflammation diffuse or is it focal? Um, so here we have three focal lichenoid infiltrates. And even at this low magnification, you can see that these are not all lymphocytes, they're pale and obviously, as you've learned over the course of these lecture series throughout the year, whenever you get pale cells at low magnification, you should be thinking histiocytes. And I want you to spend time at low magnification thinking that before you go instantly to high magnification. So say low power looks pale, probably histiocytes. Let's go to higher magnification and confirm. Yes, they're histiocytes. We see three small aggregations. We see these little, uh, when you look at the epidermis, you always want to look at the epidermal changes associated with the lichen or inflammatory infiltrate. Is there the weight shaped hypergranulosis and hyperkeratosis like we saw with lichen planus? Um, or is it not really hypergranulotic and no hyperkeratosis like we have here? And we have what looks like a cholerate of epithelium surrounding the granulomatous lichen or infiltrate. So when you see those factors together, the number one diagnosis should be lichenitis when you see that pattern. Okay, so this is lichenoid granulomatous, focally lichenoid, with histiocytes predominating, with some lymphocytes, but histiocytes predominating. So this would be lichenitis, classic pattern, and really you shouldn't even think about lichen planus when you see something like this. So, uh, so the, you know, the, the difference of diagnosis comes up of, of lichenoid granulomatous that I mentioned before. And there's a relatively few number of entities that can give you a lichenoid, a true lichenoid granulomatous histology. This is one of them, lichenitis. Granulomatous mycosis fungoides is another. There's a form of granulomatous persistent pigmented purpuric dermatitis that can give you a lichenoid granulomatous inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, rarely, some lichenoid drug eruptions, rarely lichenoid drug eruption can be granulomatous inflammation, and then syphilis, and then perineoplastic granulomatous lichenoid process. If you see granulomatous lichen infiltrate in an older individual and it sort of looks like TPD clinically and it shows granulomatous inflammation, um, that can sometimes be a perineoplastic process, just like perineoplastic GA, perineoplastic GA like eruption can be perineoplastic. You know, lichenoid granulomatous in an older person, think about uh, a, a perineoplastic process. And then, you know, we mentioned syphilis, obviously, can do this too. So that's it. That's it. So that's a, a small, low, few number differential diagnostic uh, list. So uh, that's the good news. So when you see that pattern, you should be thinking of, of really those four to five, to six things that can cause that. Uh, in this case, it happens to be like a nitidus. So it's always nice when you get a, a, a different diagnosis that, that just has, you know, eight to 10 things or fewer, not one that has 20 things in it. So uh, just remember that. The uh, the histiocytes in lichenitis are usually not multinucleated. They're just these histiocytes like you see here. They're epithelioid and they form these uh, little sort of mini sarcoidal granulomas. Um, it's rare for sarcoid to give you a true lichenoid granulomatous inflammatory reaction. And in Hansen's disease, even though you often would get a band-like infiltrate of histiocytes, it actually gives you a grenzo. So that's why it's not good to just lump everything that's band like into uh, lichenoid, because unless it really truly obscures the junction, it's really not truly lichenoid and that's sloppy thinking. So we talk about Grenzone in, in Hansen's, uh, 
that's not really like an oil. Okay. All right, we'll move on to the next case. And now we're going to be talking about a vacuolar interface process. And um, this disease is one that is uh, kind of controversial in some ways. And notice here we have small little holes at the dermal junction. And we have lots of melanophages. So this basically is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And really, we don't really know for sure that it's hyperpigmented here. This could be post-inflammatory hypopigmentation as well. This could be a very dark skin patient that's lost pigment. And when you get melanophages, which you can see in either hyper or hypopigmentation, that doesn't really impart the color change. Most of the color is in the epidermis. So uh, basically, you can have lots of melanophages in somebody that's, that's got a very white post-inflammatory change in their skin. Um, and so the melanophages are not going to make the skin dark. It's really primarily epidermal and, and higher level pigment that gives you most of the color change in the skin. So this is an example in this case of erythematous chromicum perstans. Uh, we don't really know what erythematous chromicum perstans is. In some cases, it's clearly a burned out variant of lichen planus. So this theoretically could be lichen planus pigmentosus uh, histologically. Um, in some cases, it's just possibly some other inflammatory reaction that gives you this. And a lot of people used to say that, well, every case of EDP is, is really post-inflammatory change from lichen planus. I don't think that's true every time. It probably is true some of the time, but it's not true every time. And you see these people from uh, uh, Central South America or from Mexico, they come into this very, very diffuse, reticulated and diffuse slate gray pigmentation, and there's no evidence of lichen or inflammatory infiltrate anywhere. Uh, so I don't think in those patients, it really is lichen planus. I think some of those patients have some sort of phototoxic drug reaction, maybe some sort of phototoxic reaction that from something they may be ingesting, some kind of natural product, and they get a widespread process. And when you biopsy it, it looks like this. And so EDP and, and post uh, lichen planus hyperpigmentation will very commonly give you a slight amount of vacuolar change with all the uh, melanophages here. Now, you can get post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration with no vacuolar alteration. So when you see it, it's suggestive of EDP. It's not pathognomonic of EDP. It's suggestive of it when you see it in a setting. So that's, that's kind of an important point. But this could be theoretically a post-drug-related drug reaction, uh, post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration. It could be some other reaction that's giving you post-inflammatory uh, dispigmentation. But when you get the vacuolar changes at the D junction plus the melanophages, that's what EDP is supposed to look like. So just kind of remember it um, from that perspective. Now, we're going to go back to this pattern, which is again, got now more of a possible lichenoid infiltrate again. We've got some infiltrate at the dermatomal junction that's focally obscuring the derma, uh, dermatomal junction over here. So this is, is really kind of focally lichenoid. Not, it's not lichenoid across the entire process. So it doesn't look like classic lichen planus, as you can see. It's got an uh, abnormal cornified layer with parakeratosis at the top of it here. And um, it's got an infiltrate of lymphocytes and you know, perhaps even got some dyskeratotic keratinocytes here. And in this case, the difference of diagnosis would be really not classic lichen planus here. I would be thinking perhaps something like maybe a, an unusual variant of pityriasis lichenoides, although it doesn't have a lot of neutrophils in the cornified layer. Um, it doesn't have a lot of extravasated erythrocytes. It doesn't have uh, that many dyskeratotic keratinocytes. So those would be features that would be a little bit uh, against that. If you see eosinophils in the infiltrate, like you see over here, you would pretty much exclude that diagnosis because you don't get eosinophils in pityriasis lichenoides. That's one of the, the relatively truistic things in, in dermatopathology. So this, would, this is an example of a so-called lichenoid drug eruption. And this one doesn't look like classic lichen planus. It, it's got some unusual features. It's got more parakeratosis, which you don't usually see in lichen planus. It's not as dense, densely lichenoid as we see with lichen planus. So when drugs induce um, other patterns, like when they induce a, you induce a drug-induced pityriasis rosea-like eruption, that doesn't look like classic PR. When you get a lichenoid drug eruption, it usually doesn't look like classic um, like in planus, it, it can, but it usually doesn't. So uh, when you get a drug-induced process that's kind of simulating uh, one of the classic neurologic disorders, it usually looks a little bit different. Uh, 
as you see here. And again, the clue to this is the admirable parakeratotic cornified layer, which you don't see with lichen planus, and the presence of some eosinophils, which you usually don't see with lichen planus. So uh, again, another example of a, of a lichenoid process, this time due to drug hypersensitivity. Now, uh, this case is a good example. And uh, even though this has the name lichenoid, it, it often doesn't have a very dense lichenoid infiltrate, but you can see this is a, uh, you know, it's a, a at low power, you can see that it goes all the way to the fat and it's a pretty thin biopsy relatively thin biopsy, but it goes down to the fat. So this is, was taken and also has no sun damage. This actually was taken from a young person, it came from a kid. And you can see that it's got kind of an interesting pattern here. It's got the lichenoid inflammation up here, and it is truly lichenoid. It truly is obscuring the dermatopurbal junction. It, uh, it's got a little bit of hyperkeratosis, but it doesn't have like a classic wedge-shaped hypergranulosis like we saw with lichen planus before. It's got some hyperkeratosis, but it's not as dense and, and hyperkeratotic and compact as we saw with the lichen planus. And notice it's also got both a deep component with involvement around the adnexal structures, especially the eccrine sweat glands. So we've got a lichenoid infiltrate that also involves the uh, underlying eccrine sweat glands. And when you see that pattern, and the infiltrate here consists mostly of lymphocytes. Uh, you can sometimes get some dyskeratotic keratinocytes. You can sometimes even get some spongiosis and maybe even occasionally a cinephil here. This is the classic pattern for lichen striatus or one of the blashcoid inflammatory processes, blashkitis, for example. Those all give you this lichen infiltrate with periadnexal periacrine involvement. This actually came from a kid. And uh, there's an eosinophil here. There's even a couple of plasma cells here. So obviously we would want to exclude the diagnosis of syphilis whenever there are plasma cells in an infiltrate that's kind of lichenoid. I want you to always think about the possibility of syphilis and consider doing a, a treponema pallidum stain or getting a DDRL. Um, so just make sure that you, you know, if you do see plasma cells in a lichenoid process, I want you to at least think about syphilis. That may not be you get an occasional plasma cell in lichen planus, occasional plasma cell here in lichen stratus, occasional plasma cell um, in uh, lichen or drug eruption or whatever. But if you see uh, a fair number of plasma cells with histiocytes that are poorly formed granulomas, well, then you should always think about the diagnosis. You should always uh, perform stains to exclude that diagnosis. But when you see lichenoid plus periecrine, think lichen stratus. Okay, and clinically, these are usually linear lesions. They're going down Blaschko's lines, segmental eruptions. Um, they can involve uh, all the way down to the fingertip, to the back of the arm or shoulder. You can get some male dystrophy with, with uh, lichen stratus. So anyway, just uh, think about lichen stratus. We see this pattern, it's a good example of it. And it can give you a true lichenoid process here. Sometimes give you some spongiosis. Now this is not the uh, complete encyclopedic um, version of uh, all the lichenoid inflammatory infiltrates in the skin. I'm showing you 10 cases today. There are plenty of others. I mean, syphilis can do it. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of other things that can sometimes give you lichen inflammatory infiltrates in the skin. So I want you to remember those and, and study those on your own. But these are just some good examples of mostly lichenoid inflammatory infiltrates. And then we got a couple that are more vacuolar like this one. So low magnification here, we've got a superficial and mid perivascular infiltrate consisting mostly of lymphocytes. And as we go to higher magnification, this is not a lichenoid process. So we do not have lichenoid inflammation here. We have vacuolar alteration, and we've got some small little holes at the dermal junction. This isn't the, the best example in the world. I mean, if we see some examples, we see really lots of holes. It's better on this side over here. So we've got the vacuolar alteration plus a lymphocytic infiltrate. And the classic variant of this, we're going to superficially deep infiltrate with more lymphocytes here. Uh, and sometimes we'll even see some mucin. I think we might see some mucin between the collagen bundles over here. Um, again, with lupus erythematosus, you don't have to have one molecule of mucin. If you see it, it's great. It's just a helpful clue, but it's not a diagnostic criterion for the diagnosis of lupus. But if you have an interface dermatitis with vacuolar alteration and a superficial and usually deep infiltrate of lymphocytes, sometimes can be superficial like we see here, you should think about lupus erythematosus.
Now, you can get lupus erythematosus like drug eruptions. Interface drug eruptions look very much like this. So once again, if you get eosinophils, that would tend to favor a drug eruption over lupus erythematosus, but it doesn't uh, mean that it's a drug eruption. Uh, you can get some eosinophils in lupus, and uh, you can get drug eruptions with interface dermatitis with absolutely no eosinophils. So once again, just uh, that's just a clue to the diagnosis if they're present and it's not an absolute diagnostic criterion. So uh, again, this is an example of lupus, but the main thing I want you to know here is just noticing the, the difference between vacuolar alteration and lichenoid inflammation, both forms of interface dermatitis. So one gives you holes, one gives you a, a dense infiltrate that obscures the DE junction. So if you can't really draw a nice line that says, okay, here is uh, Canada and here's the United States or whatever, um, then you've got a blurred interface and then you're dealing with either lichen inflammation, if there's lots of inflammation there or vacuolar alter alteration where these holes. Okay, and the other, some of the other uh, vacuolar diseases we think about are things like fixed drug eruption. Uh, we think about erythema deformi, all of those drug, you know, interface drug re reactions that are not necessarily lupus related. Uh, so again, make sure you know the differential diagnosis of all of these interface dermatitis with vacuolar alteration as well. Okay. So the last one we're going to talk about uh, here um, is another lichenoid process. I'm going to hire magnification over here. And you can see that the interface has basically been trashed here. There's a, there's a lichen infiltrate here of lymphocytes, some neutrophils that's basically just obscuring the dermatomal junction. This has both vacuolar and, and the other side, maybe even more lichen inflammation over here. So we've got uh, lymphocytes here in a lichenoid pattern, not as dense as lichen planus, but we've got kind of a combination of vacuolar and lichenoid. I'd say this one is probably more vacuolar than lichenoid, but you can see that there's this crashing into the epidermis of this, this inflammation is just basically going into the epidermis, obscuring the dermatomal junction, lots of dyskeratotic keratinocytes, lots of extravasate erythrocytes, and then this confluent parakeratosis, sometimes even with some neutrophils in the cornified layer. And this is classically uh, what we see with pityriasis lichenoides. Okay, and there's several different forms of pityriasis lichenoides. If you get a superficial and deep wedge-shaped infiltrate that's very dense with lichen infiltrate in that situation and this pattern here, that's the classic form for Mucha Haberman disease, pityriasis lichenoides at Varioliformis acuta. And then if you see this pattern that's more kind of vacuolar interface like you see here with variable amounts of lichen inflammation, that's the more classic pattern that we see with pityriasis lichenoides chronica. Now, the one thing I don't like about naming diseases based on whether they're acute or chronic is that you can get someone that's got pityriasis lichenoides for 25 years, and they can develop acute lesions that pop up that may maybe three days old, and they can look like this. So this lesion could have come acutely in someone with long-standing pityriasis lichenoides, but it doesn't have the classic acute pattern that we see with the so-called Mucha Haberman form, where you actually get the varioliform blistering and the erosions and those kind of things that we see clinically. So, uh, and then you can have some patients that have, uh, you know, the classic pityriasis, uh, you know, the Mucha Haberman disease that have histology that looks kind of like this. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. The main thing is to understand the pattern, this interface dermatitis, vacuolar, sometimes lichenoid, just like with lichen plants, you get lots of inflammation. This one doesn't have as much of the true lichen inflammation that, that's really obscuring, but there is a lot of inflammation here as well, but it has lots of vacuolar alteration and lots of inflammation in the epidermis. And then the dyskeratotic keratinocytes and the overlying parakeratosis. So one thing about this too, you do not see eosinophils in pityriasis lichenoides. If you see eosinophils, then you should not think about the diagnosis. You really think about something else, maybe a pityriasis lichenoides like drug eruption or some other process that's associated with hypersensitivity. This is not really thought to be a hypersensitivity reaction per se. Um, one other item that can look very similar to pityriasis lichenoides is lymphomatoid papulosis. And a lot of different subtypes of pityriasis, uh, lymphomatoid papulosis, there's, there are types that can look very lichenoid. Uh, obscure the dermatomal junction, look a lot like lichen planus, but they have the atypical lymphoid cells in the infiltrate. Uh, they can get eosinophils in those infiltrates, and they can also obviously be CD30 positive when you stain those with uh, CD30. So those are uh, kind of a, a survey 
if you will, of, of some of the more common lichenoid inflammatory conditions and some of the a few interface vacuolar conditions. Just make sure you know uh, the general category, uh, the diagnostic criteria, the difference between lichenoid and band-like, uh, and understand uh, the importance of looking at the cell types and then changes in the epidermis and the cornified layer. Those are the ancillary criteria that allow you to make a definitive diagnosis when you're dealing with a lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate. And uh, most of the time, when they're pretty classic patterns like you see here, you're going to be able to make the different make the diagnosis with specific uh, specificity. The board exam is not going to give you anything that's borderline or unusual or tricky. They're going to give you some pretty classic examples and expect you to be able to recognize those and then understand um, clinical features associated with those. So uh, again, we're winding down. I think we don't have a talk next week. I think we have one in two weeks, uh, which we will uh, be talking, I guess the next talk is on the 16th and uh, we'll be, uh, I'm sorry, we have metabolic disorders and then neural tumors. It's gonna be on the 23rd and then uh, neural tumors. On the 16th, actually, I'm excited to uh, announce to you that we're gonna be giving a, a uh, one of, we, we actually, a couple of years ago before COVID-19, uh, pandemic hit, we were giving a series of lectures related to business aspects of medicine and, and dermatology. And uh, it was actually very well received, especially by some of the third year residents, because they're getting ready to go into practice. And I think one of the deficiencies that the residency program has is that it doesn't really teach you guys anything about the business aspects of, uh, of medicine. Uh, I suffered through that myself and kind of had to learn a little bit through the school of hard knocks. So uh, a few years ago, I went back and, and decided to get uh, two different MBA degrees, uh, one just a general business MBA degree and another one in commercial real estate, since I actually have been dealing in, in real estate related issues with regard to our building that we have here and some things like that. It's been very, very educational and eye-opening, learned a lot of things that uh, I was never exposed to in college, medical school or residency. And so I sort of decided to go back and educate myself about that. So uh, being a, an educator of dermatology residents and others, I thought, well, hey, why don't we share this with you guys as well? So uh, we have a, uh, a evening session coming up uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, Central Daylight Time. I'm pretty sure that date is correct. It's possible that might change. Um, but we're going to, it's for, for now, it's considered, it's going to be at 7 p.m. Central Bay time. And it's going to be basically business 101 for medical people, medical personnel. And feel free to join uh, anywhere across the United States. You're welcome to join um, the, uh, uh, you know, bring your spouses, your friends, anybody who wants to get in here. And so it's, it's uh, we're going to go through some of those important things you need to know about business and related to medicine and, and things that are important to you when you go into practice, or if you, even if you go into academic practice or go into industry, whatever, these are general business principles that you can use um, to help you be more successful in whatever venue you use. So uh, thanks again for your attention, and we will see you for another one of these talks on the 23rd, uh, and then the business talk, which is now tentatively scheduled for uh, that 7 p.m. on the 16th. If that date changes, we will let you know. Thanks again.